everyone, and welcome to the third episode of Not Just Numbers, Honest Conversations with a Financial Advisor and Lawyer. I'm Madison DeMora, and I am here with Mike Gary. Mike is the founder and CEO of Yardley Wealth Management, a firm found he founded in 2006. We are located right outside of Philadelphia in Yardley, Pennsylvania, which is in Bucks County. Mike, in the previous episode, we spoke a little bit about your firm, and I was wondering if we could speak a little more so listeners can understand a bit more about us. Of course, and it's your firm too, Maddie. (laughs) I think it's a great idea. Awesome. So how do your interactions with your clients work? Um, How often do you meet with them? Can they reach out to you? Sure. Well, in the beginning, there's a lot of interaction, right? There's um, a lot of calls and emails. There will be at least two, three, four appointments in the first couple of months till everything gets squared away. Um, you know, that's where we do the initial planning and we, we work with the process of getting accounts set up and transferred, make sure everything's good. We'll do a check-in meeting, like maybe 45 days after everything's set up, make sure everybody's getting their statements, they can log in, everything's going the way they want it. Um, and then we think it really depends on the client, what the client wants and what the client situation is. And so if you are getting ready to retire or sell your business or something, we might need to speak a little bit more often. Um, If it's rolling along and no changes, we should check in at least annually, maybe semi-annually, just to make sure everything is going okay. Make sure we, you know, we review what your goals and situation is. Really make sure that we know who you are. Because, you know, once people are clients for a while, we have pretty good relationships with them. We know a lot about their families. Um, their interests, their goals. Um, And so that when they call at any time, which they can, it's not like, oh, who is this client number 34651? It's like, no, like we know them. It's John and Mary, and we've known them for a long time. And yeah, they're, you know, they're part of our extended family. Uh, So, and yes, so we we ask for those. And I joke, right? Like some people we call or meet quarterly because they really need that. And other people, we can't subpoena to get them in here on annual meetings, right? And so it really is up to the client in the situation. Um, and what I'd say is for the client to figure out what's comfortable for them. If they want to hear more from us, let us know. We'll make sure that happens. If they don't really like me and they don't want to talk to me, like well, we can handle that too, really. It, it's whatever the client needs. We could take care of that and, and we, could, um, we could get to the level that they want. Uh, we have all kinds of different contact with our different clients, um, and hopefully we can find out what's right for you, too. Awesome. So that leads me into my next question. So what are the most important aspects of maintaining a good relationship with a client? Yeah, I think it's a, a open uh, dialogue and, and extended conversations. So, you know, a lot of meetings, hopefully in person and for, for people who aren't local, we could use a video uh, or even old school phone calls. It, it really the really important thing is to make sure we really know what's going on in their lives that impacts their financial planning and their investments so that we can make sure that, you know, their planning investments accurate, accurately reflect what they need. Um, and so, yeah, I think the big part is that ongoing conversations. You know, if something's bothering you as a client, don't be afraid to say it. You know, if you're not sure how something is, don't be afraid to ask. You know, we've had all kinds of um, different questions, comments, concerns. And, you know, like a lot of times people think, oh, this doesn't make any sense. I don't want to ask this. I'll feel dumb. And that, that's really nothing could be further from the truth. You know, most people don't spend a lot of time on their finances, and that's why they hire us. So we don't expect that you're going to know everything. And we, in the beginning, we're not going to expect that you know anything. You know, we'll figure out how much you know over time and, and adjust our conversations that way. It's a good question. Yeah. So there's there's no dumb questions. Everything. No dumb questions. There you go. So um, what kind of people do you normally work with? So that's a good question, yeah. too. We get that asked a lot because most people have never worked with an advisor when they hire us. You know, most people in the country don't work with an advisor. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a normal thing. You know, beyond the fact that most people who work with us are unusually smart and good looking and successful, 
Um, I don't know if they share a lot of other common traits. Um, you know, I guess they tend to be above average in age and income and net, net worth, right? So people who are retired or are thinking about retiring are usually people that reach out to us. Um, and so that's where most of our clients are. Some of them have been wildly successful. Others have had good jobs and, and saved, um, you know, and, and got past whatever difficulties and obstacles and are still plugging along. Um, and I think one of the things that they have in common is that they want to take charge of their retirement. They want to make sure that um, they're not like hoping things will, will go well. They actually want to take control of it and plan to make sure that things go well. You know, so that whether retirement's next year or 10 or 20 years from now, uh, when the time comes, they'll be prepared because they've thought about it, planned about it, and, you know, and hired someone good to take care of it. So I, th I think that's that's the answer for that. All right. So why do you think people don't necessarily, like, why do you think people don't work with financial advisors? A couple of reasons. Uh, many people think that they can't afford it. And a lot of people uh, don't trust financial advisors. And, you know, there, there's a lot to be said for that. There's a lot of financial advisors out there who are really, really good salespeople um, and not necessarily good financial advisors. And I think a lot of people get burned by financial advisors. So I think there's reasons why people don't work with advisors. Um, we hear stories from people all the time. They come in and tell us what happened. And I, you know, I had a conversation earlier this week with a couple who had had a great interaction with an advisor when they were in their twenties and the advisor told them to do the right thing. Um, and it did not include like an ongoing relationship with that advisor. And in my opinion, it was the right thing. And I was, I don't know, I was surprised and happy. Um, and I'm glad that it happened. And like they're in, you know, they're in their fifties now and they're in great shape. And a lot of it has to do with that interaction with the advisor in the twenties who did the right thing. You know, for every story like that, I hear 10 stories where, where they sold them an annuity product and, you know, they were 25 year olds that had come into some money and the annuity product would have been absolutely wrong. But that annuity product would have would have gotten that advisor a six percent commission, and that's why usually those stories don't end that well. So I think those are the main reasons, right? Like mistrust, um, and you know, not thinking they have enough money. You know, our company is Yardley Wealth Management, right? And so that that name is basically you know, this is the area we're in, and, and this is the industry that we're in, and it makes sense for SEO and for the website and all that. Um, and it's also kind of plain. But, you know, it's also loaded. Like, well, what does wealth management mean? You know, most people that are mildly successful or even pretty successful don't think of themselves as wealthy. Um, and, you know, we don't cater to just wealthy people. Um, but yeah, there's a lot, a lot that goes into it, Maddie. Um, yeah. And, you know, a lot of the country, quite frankly, just doesn't have any money. Um, so they wouldn't have the need for a, a service. Um, now, there are people, though, even if they don't have a lot of money, who could stand to use some financial advice, and there are advisors out there who will work for an hourly fee or a project fee, or you know, if somebody has something very specific, they want to ask. It doesn't mean they're necessarily clients for us, um, but, but there are advisors now that they could talk to, which is a great thing. That is a great thing. So steering a little away from this, um, how do you stay up to date on the changes in the financial industry? Funny you should ask. Remember we had that conversation just yesterday because I had to do some CLE for my uh, law license. Uh, well, we had the conversation Wednesday. I had to take some CLE classes yesterday. So as you know, I get four daily newspapers and I generally go through them every morning with a cup of tea. Um, and the puppies, uh, and my wife, and uh, I also have, so I'm a lawyer in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, so I need to have uh, continuing, I have a continuing ed requirement for each of those, um, PA is every year, New Jersey's every other year, um, they overlap, uh, so I don't have to take like multiples of those. Uh, as a CFP, I need to take hours every year or every other year as a NAPFA member. 
I have to take hours every other year. And as uh, an accredited investment fiduciary, I have to take hours every year. Altogether, it winds up being uh, several weeks worth of continuing education courses um, every year. Uh, and so that, <laughs> that's a good part of it. Um, and I also subscribe to a couple of services. Uh, there's a guy in our industry, Bob Veras, who reviews the six main industry magazines and a couple of main like educational websites. Um, and then he will write a little synopsis. And so I don't need to like comb the internet trying to find out what's important. Now that I'm pretty experienced, I know uh, from the synopsis whether it's something that I know and it's okay, I don't need to explore further, or if it's a, an idea that I'm like, oh, you know what, I need a refresher, or it's a totally new idea and I need to look into that. And so, yes, it, it takes a lot of time, like this long-winded answer. <laughs> it takes a lot of time, but, you know, it, it's good. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I am intellectually curious. And so, you know, I like learning about this industry and I like learning about different things that, that help people and, um, and make me be a better advisor. So it, it's, it's easy, you know, it's time consuming, but it's, it's stuff that I love. Yeah. So yeah. are we ready to get into today's topic for discussion? I think we are. So what would you like to talk about today? So I'd like to talk about crypto and unforeseen risks. Let's talk about risk, Maddie. All right. So what do you mean unforeseen? Um, everyone knows how risky crypto is, right? Everybody knows how risky crypto is now. This time last year, people couldn't get enough of it. We went to a conference in Miami last February, and every every um, topic, every every presentation was like somehow brought crypto into it. And I was like, wait, isn't this an ETF conference? It's not a crypto conference. Yeah, but so yeah, crypto hasn't had a great year. Um, and so now people see how risky that is. Um, and I don't know whether it will come back or, or if um, a couple of coins will stay in the mainstream. I, I don't know. Um, but there's a story that I, that was kind of related to crypto in the paper, and I wanted to talk about that. All right. So that's about crypto. Yeah. So there's an article uh, about a guy who took money from, he sold his house, and he needed to put money somewhere safe because uh, they were going to build another house. So they sold their house, put their money in an account with BlockFi, um, and it said it was going to pay 6.5% interest. And then they they were going to save it for a short amount of time. They moved in with their in-laws and they were going to like start to build their house. And then we found out how BlockFi was tied up with FTX. And um, now there's a problem with that. And so um, what he thought was going to be a safe investment, it's not actually insured. And right now, Things don't look too good. So why do you think um, people are so into crypto nowadays? Like what caused the spark? Yeah. So, you know, if, if you had bought Bitcoin 10 years ago, it would be worth thousands of times how much, right? And so anytime any kind of asset goes up a lot, people want to go in. You know, unfortunately, it's always after the fact, right? So like, oh, Bitcoin's gone up so much. Let's go in now. Or this real estate has gotten so expensive around here. It must be a time to buy, right? And when you're not like the first one in and you're just like piling in later, it adds to the risk. Um, you know, and the, the risk um, about the, the, the crypto related thing is so, so he did, this guy took that $600,000 it was not invested in crypto, right? So if he had put $600,000 into crypto thinking like, hey, you know, maybe this will go up a thousand times or 10 times or five times, that's understandable. But he thought he was getting like a safe investment, right? He thought, you know, they the people at um, BlockFi told him it was safe. He knew it wasn't insured, but, you know, people buy uninsured stuff all the time and, and it, it works most of the time. 
but it's not looking good for him. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a cautionary tale, right? So here's the thing. So say you buy, say you take $600,000 and you put it in crypto and you know, based on like the fact that it went down 70% last year, you're making a big bet, but there's a big potential payoff, right? If, if like it goes up 10 times, which we've seen it happen in the last couple of years, it could be where it be huge. Here's the difference. This guy took that risk and all he, the, his reward maybe was like 10 or $20,000, right? So like if he had, he was getting, he was promised six and a half percent. At the time he did that, he could have gotten a CD for two and a half percent, right? So you're looking at six months at 4% on $600,000, that's $12,000. So he took that giant risk and probably lost that money or most of that money for an extra $12,000, right? That's 2%. Like that, that risk does not make any sense to take. And I, I my guess is he had no idea how risky that was. Um, but I, you know, I wish that he understood that risk. Um, it's sad. It's a sad Absolutely. story. Absolutely. So BlockFi was closely associated with FTX and FTX went under. So did BlockFi. So was he able to get his money back? Well, they didn't say in the story, but it, it seemed you know pretty unlikely at this point. Okay. So like, uh, look, I, I would say like, he clearly didn't appreciate the risk he was taking for so little reward. And I, so I think it's important to separate like your savings and your investing, right? If you need money for something in the short term and it has to be a certain amount, you need to put that in like a CD or a government bond that is liquid at the time that you want. And yes, your returns from that are going to be small. You're not going to double your money in a CD or a government bond, but you need to make sure that that money is there when you need it, because that guy now can't buy that house. And he, I hope he gets along well with his in-laws because he might be living there for a long time. You know, that, that's such a sad story. So this, you know, back when I was a, a very new in this industry, I had stopped being a lawyer full time, but I was working at, at um, that big bank that has a bull as its symbol. And my manager um, went through this story and he told me that at the time he bought like these hospital bonds that were double A rated. Um, and he did that to get like an extra 10th of a percent more than the triple A rated bonds that were available in the marketplace that were insured. So if a bond is insured, it means that if the issuer defaults, then there's insurance that will pay it. So, you know, it's a great extra layer of protection. Um, and to me, it's worth it. And so this guy sold these bonds to, to a lot of his clients that um, went ultimately went bankrupt. And so for a couple of months, they were trading at 100. And then all of a sudden, they were trading at 60. And then for a couple of months, and then they, they were out, right? So people lost their money in these bonds. And he did that for an extra 10th of a percent. So he it... it he took that giant amount of risk for a trivial amount of extra return. That is a big, big, big mistake in my, in my book, right? So we invest in stocks and bonds, or we invest in like funds that have stocks and bonds. We take risks in the stock funds, right? Um, because stocks return a lot more than bonds over time. And that, that's where we're hoping to make money in the stock market. The bond funds that we buy, yes, they, they go up and down because interest rates change and they go up and down, but we buy investment grade bond funds. So, and so they're going to be funds that have hundreds or thousands of bonds in them that are all investment grade. So if one or two of them go belly up, it's going to have a minimal or an, even an immaterial impact on your overall return. Because we don't like taking risk in the bond market. It doesn't make sense. Like that's the safe part of your portfolio. If you, know, if you get a couple extra percent return, but then maybe the bond doesn't pay back, that is not worth the extra risk, right? Your stock can, can go up that extra couple percent in one afternoon or an hour. Um, 
So I, I think that the big thing here about risk, Maddie, is like know what you're getting into, know what risks you're taking, and make sure that that they are appropriate for what you're trying to do. Does that does that make sense? Absolutely. Am I just like going like blah 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 blah? Does <laughs> any of that get through? <laughs> Absolutely, it totally makes sense. So basically separate your savings and your investings and understand the risks you're taking with your money and yeah. know where your money's going. So you are a young lady, you're saving, you know, hopefully buy a house one day. So where would you put your house savings in crypto or an insured bank account or, or a, or a um, cutting edge stock? Let me think. Crypto? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. So definitely um, probably something insured, maybe like some type of insured CD, insured bond. Um, am, I, am I on the right track? You are on the right track. Yeah. Okay. So, you, you know, at your bank, you can have up to $250,000 in insurance on a savings account. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you could you could have like different CDs from different issuers. Um, you know, or if you have a, you know, for people who have a lot of money and they need it to be insured, you go, we just earlier this week for a, a client, uh, or last week we bought a uh, treasury bonds, right. And so, you know, they are going to pay them back, you know, maybe the, the maybe the, the, the value, um, will be hit a little bit by inflation, but you know, we buy a million dollars in that treasury note. And that matures on June 1st, you're going to get that million dollars back. That's going to happen. You put it in an uninsured account and it'll probably get back. And then the question is like, it's probably good enough in that circumstance. And I'd say, no, that, that's, that's, that's where I'm going to stand. Okay. So going back to the guy trying to, um, reach his savings goal in the short term, what would you recommend people do if they have um, a short-term savings goal? Yep. So in that instance where he had like six month goal and he had $600,000, um, what I think the, the best thing probably, if, it did, if he didn't have a specific date in mind, you can get um, a high yield insured savings account uh, online, and he was a younger guy, so I don't think the online would be a hard thing. You could go to Nerd Wallet or Bankrate. They'll list like the top 10 rates in, in their view. They'll all be insured, and you could open an account with a few clicks in a few minutes, and you could transfer money electronically. Uh, and since it's a $250,000 limit on the insurance, he'd have to open up three of them, right? So maybe if his regular checking, whether his regular bank has like a high yield account, he could put um, $200,000, $250,000 in that. Um, and then the other three fifty, dollars he would just split up among two other banks, right? Because you don't want to go, you like the insurance, but it's only insured up to that certain amount. So you don't want to have more than that in the account. You know, again, it's, it's really highly unlikely that something would go, especially in a bank that has an insured product. But why take the risk? Take two more minutes with a few more clicks and open up another account. So will that be, a, yeah, go ahead. go ahead. I was just going to say, that's a good segue into our next episode because we're going to talk about all the money people are leaving on the table by keeping money in their regular banks. Oh, well, that's exciting though. I'm excited for the next episode. That should, that should be good because. Yeah, how do you, be good. yeah, yeah. It's, it's free money, Maddie, free money. Yeah. So you don't want to leave your money just sitting in your bank account, checking right. account. Yep. We'll get into yep. that next episode. We will we'll get into that. This has so, been great, Maddie. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. So this was awesome. Um, thank you, Mike, uh, for the useful information. And I hope this really reaches the right people so um, we can help people help people stay on track and be aware of what they should be doing with their money or at least suggest it. So do you have anything else you wanted to cover in today's episode? Not today. Thanks, All Maddie. right. All right. Sounds good. So for more information on Yardsley Wealth Management, you could visit our website at yardsleywealth.net. You can also follow us on socials at Yardsley Wealth Management. This podcast has been produced by Madison DeMora and Mike Gary oh. <laughs> with technical and artistic help from Poe Productions. Oh.
Thank you.